This podcast is for mature audiences. It contains graphic violence and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. Realm presents Blood and Gold, starring Richard Cabral, episode 11. February 1852, San Jose, California. The Mexican-American War may be over, but settler colonists in the Western territories wage war against the indigenous peoples. In Trinity County, California, a militia of 70 white men murder more than 150 Wintu people in the Bridge Gulch Massacre. Antonia liked to visit her parents in San Jose whenever she could. But the Molinera home was small. So I, claiming to be Julian Vallejo, an imaginary wealthy rancher from Santa Barba, purchased a grand house on the corner of Fourth and San Fernando with stone walls and three stories. We sometimes made the trip alone, just the two of us. But other times I brought a larger party and the house had room for all of us. On this occasion, 10 men accompanied us, carrying with them a small arsenal of weapons and ammunition. My spies had told me of a large transfer of currency to the bank in San Jose, and I intended to transfer that currency to myself. The sweetest twist was that I had bought the house from the head of the bank himself who had recently moved to an even larger one nearby. I had gone so far as to confirm the transfer with the banker, one Virgil T. McGee, owner of the Capital Banking Company. All manner of currency was in use in California, including gold and silver dust and nuggets, but also Mexican reals, double reals, dollars, French francs, English shillings, Dutch florins, and guilders, even Indian rupees. Occasionally, continental currency showed up, though most of it was frayed and ripped. McGee's Capital Bank had printed up its own paper money to be backed by its reserves of gold and silver in order to try to standardize the currency of the region. McGee was proud of it and happy to discuss it with his new neighbor. I consulted with Antonia and Pancho Dominguez on the plan because the latter loved plans and considered himself a strategic genius. I wasn't so sure about the genius part, but he often came up with some good ideas. Between his and Antonia's contributions, our plan seemed sound and simple enough to pull off. I would ride over a few minutes ahead of my comrades and go into the bank. If McGee was there, I would exchange a few pleasantries and leave it quickly, and we would wait until another time. If McGee wasn't there, I would note the position of any guards and anything else that might present a problem, then go back outside and tell my men what to expect. Forewarned, we go in with guns bristling, disarm the guards, and take the bounty. The morning was cold, but clear. The sky so crisply blue, it almost hurt to look at. My horse, a gray mare chosen specifically for her speed, emitted clouds of steam with every breath. The bank was finished in squared off stones, the same gray as my house. A few other horses were tied to the rail outside and a couple of buggies waited nearby. I casually looped my horse around the rail, giving the mare a once over to ensure that none of the weapons she carried were easily visible to observers. Satisfied, I brushed non-existent dust from my shoulders and stepped inside. I didn't see McGee, but what I did see unsettled me. This wouldn't go exactly to plan after all. By the time I got outside again, my men had arrived, along with Antonia. She had so enjoyed the first robbery she'd been part of, 
She insisted that I'd include her in more. At first, I had resisted. But in the end, I had a hard time denying her anything she wanted. She carried an 1848 Colt Baby Dragoon, a pocket-sized revolver suited to her smaller hands. I had bought it for her and given her lessons at Arroyo de Cantua. They were waiting to one side, out of sight from the bank's door or the one large window facing onto the street. We huddled around and I told them what I'd seen inside. Two guards, one to the right of the door, about eight feet away, sitting in a chair. He's older, but he has a shotgun across his lap. The other one was leaning on the counter when I was there, flirting with a pretty tanner. He has a coat in the holster on his hip, but something else you should know. The pretty tanner and another one, a young man, are both Mexicanos. Tres Dedos didn't bother to hide his surprise. Working in a gringo bank. They're trusted to handle money? So it seems. Hmm. Quizás el mundo sí está cambiando. Maybe the world is changing. We should try not to hurt them. If we have to hurt anyone, it should be those two guards. Claudio and Luis, I want you two to go right as soon as you enter and shoot the one in the chair. Valenzuela and Juan Senata, you two go for the younger guard. Manuel, Gregorio, and Humberto will take the workers at the counter. I don't think they'll try anything, and I doubt they're armed. Just stand close and make sure they don't interfere. Antonia, you watch the customers with Reyes and Juan Gallego. They might be armed, and they might be foolish. After all, they're in there because they have money. And you, Felipe, you stay close to me. We'll bag any gold, silver, or banknotes we can find and carry them to the door. Then, as we all leave, we can each grab some bags. We'll ride out of town to the east, because that's the closest to the open country. Todo el mundo comprendió? No one said otherwise, so I walked briskly away from them, drew two pistols from my saddlebags, hid them under my coat, and went back into the bank. The others would follow a few seconds later, but the extra time would allow me to see if anything had changed in the last few minutes. I again assumed the guise of an ordinary citizen and got in line behind the other customers. The three tellers were all busy. The inside floor was tiled, the counter made of rich, dark wood. The others came in behind me. Rough-looking Mexicanos, all towering mota with his sombrero, ugly huerta, savage tres dedos, even the lovely La Molinera, each one armed. No one could possibly fail to understand what was happening. Claudio and Bolivia turned toward the seated guards before he could even react, and with two shots to the head, dropped him to the floor. A puddle of blood below his head quickly turned into a pond and would soon become a lake. Claudio snatched up the man's shotgun. The younger guard came away from the counter. He reached for the gun, holstered at his hip, but Valenzuela and Senate blocked his path. See here, you've hurt Brett. He's not hurt, he's dead. Calm down before you get the same. The guard stood still while Valenzuela relieved him of his weapon. I loudly announced the obvious. This is a robbery. Cooperate and no one will be hurt. We only want the bank's money, not yours. A couple of the customers in line shouted. One snatched a pistol from under his coat, an old single-shot flintlock model. Gallego smacked it from his hands. It clattered on the floor and Gallego kicked it away. It spun and slid to a halt against the wooden counter where Tres Dedos, Lopez, and Reyes were positioned, letting the employees know not to interfere. I shoved the barrel of my navy coat into the gut of the younger guard. Now take us to the safe. The guard's face was pale, his lower lip trembling. I was afraid he was going to vomit. Th this way. He led us toward a door at the end of the counter. It swung open as we approached, and Virgil McGee 
stood on the other side in a vest and shirt sleeves with a rifle in his hands. Beads of sweat dotted his brow. Vallejo? What's the meaning of this? Recognized even under false identity, I had no other option. I fired three times, catching McGee once in the chest and once in the neck. My third shot shattered the older man's jaw, strained teeth, bone, and blood. McGee crumpled, and Huerta snatched away his rifle as he fell. Behind me, another man had started to step into the bank. Hearing the shots and seeing what was going on, he backed out of the door, shouting, Stop. Gallego spun around and fired a shot through the glass of the door, shattering it and hitting the man in the back. He reeled, but caught himself on the side of the building, out of view, and continued screaming. I heard more shouting and the sounds of men running. Let's go! Quickly now! But the money! Forget the money, Felipe! It's our lives I'm worried about! Go! We barreled out the door, boots grinding broken glass underneath. Tres Dedos never let me to go first, so he shoved ahead and charged out front with me right behind. Outside, local men had tried to find safe positions, but few of them seemed to have real experience in a gunfight. One crouched behind a trough full of water across the street from the bank. Another stood in a shadowed doorway as if the shade itself offered him protection. Two more were in second story windows and three others stood right in the street. They opened fire as we poured out of the bank. A shot from a window hit Tres Dedos in the meat of his upper left arm, but he returned the fire with three quick shots that fouled his attacker. Two of our horses were hit, along with one horse belonging to a bank customer. A lucky shot hit Gallego in the belly. He dropped his gun and clasped both hands over it, but already blood oozed between his fingers. I felt sure the wound was fatal. I dropped to one knee and aimed at the man who shot Gallego, one of those standing in the street. My first shot was low, but I raised the barrel and I fired again, and this one hit the man square in the chest. He took a step back, looked down at his chest, then fired again, his shot ricocheting harmlessly off the stone of the bank's outer wall. Antonia and Tres Dedos got him in their sights, and we all fired at once. All three rounds hit home, and the man pitched forward. Claudio unloaded the shotgun at the man, hiding behind the wooden trough. The distance was too great for the shot to have maximum impact, but it still shredded his face and tore up the edge of the trough, splashing water everywhere. Some of the shot must have hit his left eye because he threw his gun down and clamped a hand over it, screaming. Huerta ended his pain with a shot from McGee's rifle. He levered another bullet from the rotating cylinder and fired again, removing the threat from the other window. All was acrid smoke and noise and chaos now. As we exchanged shots with the last two of the locals, two in the street and the one in the shadows of a doorway, one more horse was hit, and then Huerta took a round at the inner edge of his right eye. He dropped the rifle, and his arms and legs went limp, like a puppet with its strings cut. He collapsed where he stood. Lopez fired five shots at the man who shot him, one of those in the street, and he fell with half his head chewed away by Lopez's bullet. The man in the doorway threw his gun onto the street and curled up in a ball, trying to make himself as small as possible. The last one in the streets ran into an alley between two buildings. My last shot creased his shirt as he disappeared. In the quiet, after the gunfire, I could hear shouts and horses in the near distance. The immediate threat had passed, but things were about to get considerably worse. Montanse, ride like your life's depended on it. Gallego and Huerta weren't dead yet, but they would be soon. Tres Dedos' arm hung uselessly at his side, but he could ride. Three horses were down, so Skinny Mota climbed up behind Lopez as we all raced as planned toward the eastern edge of San Jose. 
riding west would have put us into the coastal hills too soon, and the open space of the valley would allow us more speed. Once there, I would figure out what to do next. For now, the only plan was to put distance between ourselves and any potential pursuers. This proved to be harder than I expected. We rode until the horses were covered with froth and I feared their hearts would burst. Finally, we stopped near a stream, access to which was largely choked off by the western sycamores and heavy underbrush armed with thorns. We gingerly made our way through the brush to let the horses drink and to fill our own canteens. The water was cold, as was the air, but I was glad to be off my horse and I was certain she felt the same way about me. I was crouched near the stream, holding my canteen in the flow, when Mota came up beside me. Hey, boss. Mota wore a hangdog expression at the best of times, but now he looked even glummer than usual. Humberto, I'm sorry about Juan. Yo sé que era tu amigo. I know. I just wanted to say, I thought I saw someone on our back trail. Like who? You know, like horses. A cloud of dust. Following us? Seemed like, maybe. I thought I'd climb on one of these trees. See what I could see. Just be careful you don't fall out. But if you do, land on tres dedos. Not me. <laughs> I'll try to. Does anybody have a spyglass? I didn't know the answer to that. So I repeated Mota's question louder. It turned out that Volvia had one in his saddlebag. He fetched it and handed it to Mota. I was amazed by how fast Mota went up the tree. The lowest branches were easily reached, and Mota scampered up as if he had monkeys in his family tree. In a few minutes, he was so high I could barely make him out. If it hadn't been winter and the sycamore largely bare of leaves, the man would have been hidden entirely. He stayed up for a short while. The sun glinted off the spyglass two or three times, and then the tree rustled again as Mota descended. Well, 20 men, maybe 25. I couldn't count for sure. 20 men? On our trail? Dead on it. How far back? Not far enough. Montanse, we're being followed. Antonia nearly dropped her canteen. By who? I don't know. Who's sheriff in Santa Clara County? John Yans? But I don't think he would leave the county. He sent a deputy. Who would he send? Probably Robert Clark. He's a big man with a huge belly and a barrel chest, bright red hair and a mustache that hangs down past his chin. There's usually some food in it from his last meal. I looked to Mota for confirmation. He shrugged. I couldn't make out that much detail. I turned back to Antonia. Is he any good? Clark? He's as stubborn as how is what I heard. Like a dog after a juicy bone. Just what we don't need, a stubborn lawman. Vayamonos de aquí. The horses objected, but our bits and bridles and spurs overcame their protest. We rode upstream for a mile or so, hoping it would hide our tracks then scrambled up the far bank and struck off in a northeasterly direction, up the valley and toward the Sierra Nevada. Clark was stubborn. I could be stubborn too, especially when evading the law was concerned. We had expected to be away from Arroyo de Cantua only for a day or two, so hadn't packed many supplies. But with the posse after us, we couldn't risk going back there, nor could we return to San Jose. Instead, we headed north, stopping at the homes and ranches of friends who could hide and feed us for a few hours. We didn't dare stop any place for longer than that. Always, we moved on before Clark's posse arrived. But a few times, the pursuers came close. The days and nights were colder in the north, 
with snow on the ground in some spots, smaller creeks and ponds frozen over. This was another problem not planned for, as we expected to ride from temperate San Jose straight to Arroyo de Cantua. If we successfully filled our pockets at the bank, we could have bought heavier coats or woolen shirts. But because our plan had been to leave with the bank's riches, we hadn't carried much of our own. I worried about Antonia and wished I never allowed her to take part. Angry and bitter, I sat one night, shivering beside a small fire that caution wouldn't allow us to build any larger. I sipped coffee from a tin cup, but even with that, I felt like I would never be warm again. It was as if California had descended into eternal winter. When Reyes Feliz approached me with a newspaper in his hands, I almost snapped at him. He held it to me, folded to a particular page. Like Rosita and me, he'd been educated in the mission school. I grabbed this back in Centerville to use in the fire, but I decided to read it first. You should look at this. ¿Qué pasa? Just read it. I snatched the paper from his hands. The headline he had folded it to caught my eye. I dreamed I met the bandit Joaquin. It said, Looking more closely, I saw that I was holding the El Dorado Republican. Thomas Springer's name was under the story. I began to read. Some readers of this newspaper may recall the Charles Dickens tales of 1843, entitled A Christmas Carol. In prose, being a ghost story of Christmas, the story tells of the miserly Ebenezer Scrooge who finds himself visited by three ghosts on Christmas Eve. This writer was not visited by ghosts, but perhaps visited one. Or was it all a dream? On Christmas Eve last, that ghost or dream personage was the bandit Joaquin Murrieta, and the place was an outlaw camp somewhere in California at which a giant bonfire roared, but a wild Christmas bacchanalia roared louder still. I arrived there, hooded, after a ride of many hours in the back of a wagon. Where in the state I was, I have no idea. When the hood was removed, I was in a canyon, surrounded by steep walls. Night had fallen, and I never saw the landscape within the canyon until the following morn. It was indistinguishable from any other places within the state. The bandit himself was a perfect gentleman, or so I dreamed him. He is fair-skinned, with dark hair and a mustache, and eyes that remind one of burning coals, full of fire, but black as night. He was polite, well-spoken, and his English, although accented, was impeccable. I never heard him speak Spanish, although some of his banditos spoke it amongst themselves. Authorities in numerous districts hold him responsible for robberies, murders, and more. I cannot say whether this dream Joaquin is guilty of those crimes or innocent, but I can say that, be his story true, he would have as much reason as any man for such actions. He came to our state like so many others in search of gold. Unlike many, he worked a rich claim until it was stolen by American miners. In the process of so doing, those miners beat him senseless, then ravaged and killed his young bride. Not long after, his brother was lynched by Americans on trumped up charges of horse theft. Marietta himself was whipped by those same stout citizens and left for dead. If it sounds as if this writer feels sympathy for this dream bandit, it should not. Any killings he may have committed simply layer more deaths upon the too many already experienced. Robbery is a scourge of our area which in the early days of the gold rush 
was known as a safe place where a man might have his gold unattended in his cabin, knowing it would be there when he returned from his claim. Those days, sadly, are gone. For his crimes, Joaquin Murrieta deserves whatever punishment the law provides. It is difficult, however, for this writer to reconcile the ghost bandit he met in a dream with the brutal killer described by so many. Having enjoyed his hospitality and his wide-ranging conversation the next morning, he seems to be the sort of man California ought to welcome rather than to harass and assault. California has, I fear, brought any predations he has committed on itself. As a people, we ought to look upon Mexicans as neighbors and friends, not enemies and not victims. This state was, after all, theirs as of quite recently. To many, it should have remained so. And regardless of the change in the landscape's legal status, the Gospels beseech us to treat one another as brothers. Perhaps those who victimized Marietta, his brother, and his bride should have remembered that from the start. By the time I finished the article, my hands were shaking so furiously that the paper tore between them. I turned to Antonia. Is everyone awake? Some are sleeping, much like I wish I was. We need to wake them. I want to be in Hangtown by morning. In the pre-dawn half-light, I watched Springer approach the door to the El Dorado Republican offices. His face was shadowed, but I could tell that he instantly tensed, shoulders tight. He pushed the door open slowly, as if expecting trouble. Hello? Is somebody here already? He paused just inside the doorway and scanned the offices. Who's there? Come in, Mr. Springer. If he'd been tense before, at the sound of my voice, he looked almost panicked, as if he might turn and run rather than continuing into his own office. Hesitant, his eyes locked on the pool of light, he made his way through the printing area, bumping into things along the way. When he reached the door to his inner office, he stopped again and peered through the glass. I moved the lamp closer to my face and beckoned with my fingers. Springer swallowed hard and opened the door. Senor Marietta, this is private property, sir. May I ask what you're doing in my office? I sat in a wooden guest chair. Springer's desk chair was empty. I waved him toward it. Sit, Mr. Springer. No need to stand on my account. The office was small and crowded. The only other chair, a guest chair like the one I occupied, was stacked high with books and paper. Common sense and practicality left Springer little choice. He took a seat behind his desk, his arms close to his sides. Uh, again, I, I ask you, what are you doing here? I specifically instructed you not to say that you met me. And I did it. If you read my piece, I... I read it. Then, then, then you know, I, I mean, I... I... <laughs> Your face. You expected me to gut you like a fish. <laughs> I, I... I thought your idea was ingenious. A dream. You met me in a dream. Brilliant. <laughs> But really? Of course. Any reader with a working brain will know that, of course, you meant me. But should anyone demand more information from you, you can deny the whole thing. Say you never met me and you made the whole thing up. Or that it was truly a dream. Springer allowed himself a satisfied smile. His chest seemed to swell a bit. Well, that was the idea. And it was a good one. I wish I thought of it myself. So, you're not angry? I was, 
when I first read it. If you'd been standing there, I might have shot you. I woke those I'd been riding with, and we came straight here, riding through the night. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized how clever you were. I reached under my coat and withdrew a bag of gold dust, placing it firmly on the desk. For your trouble, I'm sure running a newspaper is no way for a man to get rich. It's often said that the best way for a man to make a small fortune in the publishing business is to start with a large one. But sir, I cannot accept your generous offer. Why not? Do you indeed have a large fortune? I do not. But accepting money from the subject of so many stories is inherently wrong. It might affect the way I write about you henceforth, after all. And I dare say, if you're intending to continue your banditry, I'm certain I'll be writing more about your exploits. His reluctance to accept treasure seemed odd to me. But I thought I understood Springer's reasoning. He wanted to appear even-handed, unbiased toward those he wrote about. So, if the governor of California wanted a favorable story about him, come election time, and offered you money to print one, you'd refuse him as well? Not only refuse him, but publish a piece describing his offer. Will you then write something about my offer? <laughs> You're not the governor. Besides, I've never met you, except in a dream. <laughs> I laughed again. I'm surprised you made the time to come here, Senor Marietta. Are you not on the run from Deputy Clark's posse? Mm, I am. That man's the worst sort of pest. I've hardly slept these last two weeks. Hardly had a decent meal. My guts are in an uproar. And the same goes for my comrades. Worse, La Molinera rides with us. I may have some good news for you then. Clark's posse has been shrinking by the day. Those men thought they were signing up for a chase of a day or two. When it turned into a week, then 10 days, some needed to get home, back to their families and their businesses. As some abandoned the effort, Others started to feel less confident about their chances of surviving an encounter with you, should they in fact catch you. As they should, my men are angry enough to tear them apart by hand and feed the pieces to the wolves. Clark's left with less than a handful of men. He needs to get back to San Jose too, and he knows that if he actually encountered you with the minimal force remaining, it would be a slaughter. My sources say he'll claim victory later today. Not that he's killed you, but that he's obviously driven you from the state since you can't be found and you haven't robbed anyone in days. Having so declared, he'll call off the chase and go home. A thrill of hope rushed through me, an emotion I hadn't felt in what seemed like ages. Is this true? From all that I've heard, I can't swear to it, but I have good sources in San Jose. That's the best news I've heard in weeks, Mr. Springer. I must go and tell the others. Are you sure I can't leave you a little something in return? All I ask, Senor Marietta, is that whenever you see the newspaper for sale, you buy a copy. Don't steal it. I felt a flash of anger at the accusation. But then I saw that Springer's eyes were twinkling behind his spectacles, and he was working to keep a grin from his lips. I laughed once more and shook his hands before departing. You're listening to Blood and Gold, starring Richard Cabral. Blood and Gold is a Realm production in association with Stryker Entertainment. Realm. Your portal to another world. Listen away. Blood and Gold stars Richard Cabral. Based on the novel Blood and Gold, The Legend of Joaquin Murrieta by Jeffrey J. Marriott and Peter Murrieta. 
produced by Marco Palmieri, Fred Greenhalge, Kaylin West, and Haley Wagreich. Adapted for audio by Greg Cox. Directed by Fred Greenhalge. Executive produced by Molly Barton, Marcy Wiseman, Russell Binder, Peter Murrieta, Julian Yap, and Richard Cabral. Historical notes read by Elena Ray. Spanish dialogue translated by Alana Grafham. Regional dialect coaching by Luis Armando Mercado Campos. Sound design by Eric Mooney. Mixing, mastering, and additional sound design by Rory O'Shea. Audio editing by Corey Barton. Original score by Juan Carlos Enriquez. Music supervision by Marcus Begala. Production manager, Alexis Latshaw. Production coordinator, Angela Yee. Casting by Sunday Bowling and Meg Mormon. Cover art by Kendall Thomas. Executive in charge for Realm, Mary S. Adolahi. Find more shows like Blood and Gold by following Realm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at realm.fm. <laughs>